mass of crazy threes. It's a bonanza of cash and cars worth over three million dollars. The Golden Kiwi Winter Wheels region. That relationship will continue. The National Party made a lot of the Anzus Rao, claiming the government's anti-nuclear policy was leaving New Zealand defenceless. While that stand scored some points for National, the party's position on other issues was sometimes less clear amid policy and personality upheavals. Uh, discuss the, the biggest change for the National Party this year began with uh, these as words. A result, we have had a ballot and Mr Jim Bolger has been elected as leader of the party. And so Mr Bolger finally got to sit in the leader's chair. You want me to sit in it? It followed a series of disastrous opinion poll ratings by Mr Maclay and came within two months of Mr Maclay's reshuffling his shadow lineup, downgrading former Muldoon men like George Gere and Bill Birch, who then conspired with Mr Bolger to tip Mr Maclay out. He's now decided to leave politics altogether at the next election. But it's not been a great year for Jim Bolger either. National's been behind, and in some cases well behind, Labour in most opinion polls. On several occasions, he's had to repudiate what party colleagues have said. Doug Graham apparently supporting GST. So are you contradicting Mr Graham on this matter? Yes, I am. Party President Neville Young appearing to support a capital gains tax. The party has no such policy and will not have any such policy at the next election. And his own remarks to Euro Money magazine seeming to support Labour economic policy. I don't recall the precise question or the precise answer. And backing MP Neil Austin after he'd been dumped as a National Party candidate. I would have um, preferred that Mr Austin had remained as the candidate for the Bay of Towards the end of the year, Mr Bolger hit the campaign trail, trying to turn dissatisfaction with the government into votes for National at the next election. I think the, um, the government's run out of excuses. But it's one thing to complain about the government, it's quite another to vote National. Well, I believe that uh, once you start complaining about the government, you have one option left, and that's to vote for the alternative. And uh, we found that out in the 1984 election that uh, once they started to complain sufficiently about the then national government, they eventually ended up voting for the alternative. National's already releasing policy. X-tax will replace GST, and it's promising a big shake-up on industrial relations. There's a lot more policy to come next year in the run-up to the general election. The minor political parties also had a difficult 86. Following the loss of Bob Jones as leader, the New Zealand party was assimilated by national and has largely disappeared while the Democratic Party was caught up with internal wrangles. The first shock was Deputy Leader Gary Knapp announcing his resignation and calling on the party's younger members to shake up the hierarchy to give the Democrats a new direction. For party leader Bruce Beetham, that was a signal of things to come. After 14 years at the helm, Mr Beetham was toppled at the annual conference in August by Pakoranga MP Neil Morrison. At first, the former leader pledged support for Mr Morrison, but then threatened to form a rival social credit group claiming the new leadership was a power-hungry clique, betraying the party's philosophy. By year's end, though, Mr Morrison was still in control, and both Mr Knapp and Mr Beetham had announced they would be Democratic Party candidates in 1987. While the opposition parties have had a shaky year, the governments moved rapidly ahead with its restructuring plans, shaking up the whole country. For Prime Minister David Longy's government, it's been an uphill year as they've pushed ahead with their economic reforms at a pace that's led Deputy Leader Geoffrey Palmer to warn again of the danger of speed wobbles. It's been a year where Labour's relationship with its traditional backers has been severely tested, as trade unionists have protested loudly against many of the government's industrial and economic policies. A broad-left ginger group has sprouted within the party's ranks and at the annual conference finance ministers faced angry party members worried about the social effects of free market orientated change. There were also warnings of the possible electoral consequences of proceeding with such policy. The danger is that working people will not vote at all. And I have to tell you, that that is their thinking at present. Yet when it came to voting, delegates heeded calls for party unity, and the left wing lost nearly all the key issues. Although the conference did pass recommendations attempting to force MPs to act on conference decisions. Throughout it all, the Longy governments appeared grimly determined to hold its course, although some concessions have been made in response to fears that if things don't work, it could cost them the election next year. The Prime Ministers toured marginal regions explaining the policies and various studies are underway to try and counter the social impact of some of the changes.
If there's one thing Mr Longy's learned this year, it's that keeping the economic cart under control requires a steady hand if he wants to avoid a downhill slide to electoral defeat. Westport was the centre of a major police investigation at the end of August after three people died in a fire at the Buller Unemployment Centre. The drop-in centre on the main street had long been a source of friction in the community. With allegations, it was attracting an undesirable element to the town. Police left the three bodies in the burnt-out shell of the building while the cause of the fire was investigated. Later, arson was ruled out. Also at the end of August, the nation was saddened to hear that George Nepia had died at the age of 81. In 1924, invincible, Nepia was regarded as the greatest ever all-black fullback. Today, for the last time, George Nepia was lying at the entrance to his adopted meeting house here at Rangitukia. Although he was born in Wairoa, he fell in love with and married a local woman after coming back from the 1924 tour. He settled here, farming his new bride's land. Over the past three days, hundreds of mourners have come to pay their last respects and to comfort his family. Most of them have been Māori, but today they included past rugby greats with reputations like Ivan Vodanovic, Dr Manahi Paiwai, Waka Nathan, Pat Walsh, Albie Pryor and Bob Scott. Late this afternoon, George Nepia was buried in the churchyard across the road, not far from the land he farmed. On the industrial front this year, confrontation and compromise. The event that took centre stage in the industrial year was the Kawara dispute, the first evidence of the growing employer militancy. Tasman Pulp and Paper delivered an ultimatum to the union they hold responsible for most of the industrial disruption. The pulp and paper workers, who are told to sign productivity and disputes agreements with the company or the whole plant would be shut down, as indeed it was, leading to a protracted and divisive row. The pulp and paper workers had little support from other unions, both in Kawara and around the country, as most saw the dispute as a certain loser. Uh, it was harming the trade union movement to the extent that that made me realise that I'd have to get in and settle it. And I had to do some pretty tough talking and make some very hard decisions before I could settle it. And, uh, you know, you get to the stage where the workers, you get offside with them, as well as the government try to put us offside. But what must have defeated the government and their thinking was that um, uh, we were able to settle it. But the length of time it took for the dispute to be settled and the total capitulation of the pulp and paper workers to all the company demands earned both Jim Knox and the unions severe criticism for the damage it did to the union movement as a whole. Certainly it buoyed employers in other areas to adopt similar hardline tactics. One difference to industrial relations this year has been the absence of intervention from this corner. Labour Minister Stan Roger has at least been consistent, keeping out of all disputes, leaving it up to the parties. A philosophy the government's carried over into its major reform of industrial relations legislation. Although somewhat softened by the Labour caucus, the new law will allow unions to compete to some degree for members, with a minimum of 1,000 in each union. It revamps the arbitration court and conciliation procedures, and in line with the new economy, unions and employers will have to pay for the services previously provided by the Labour Department. The state sector too faces massive changes arising from this year. Their pay system for years, based on an average of private sector rates, is up for reform they too must face the chill wind of healthy competition and market forces. A government attitude that prompted threats that public servants might well campaign against the Labour government next election. In fact, 1986 has been noted for the divisions between traditional allies, like the unions and the Labour government, and for divisions internally. The Employers' Federation had the round table organisation, representing the top New Zealand companies, attempting to usurp some of its traditional authority. The round table was pressuring companies not to settle high in the award round, and forced up expectations themselves by doing higher in-house deals within their own companies. The unions were faring little better. The start of the wage round was a disaster, with the Metal Trades Award adjourned in favour of a central deal, which the government humiliated the unions and employers in rejecting. Driver's advocate Rob Campbell then ignored FOL advice and settled his award early and low, 6%. In hindsight, his members may well have done better than the metal trades, which settled a fortnight ago at 7%, but only after a lacklustre industrial campaign, which cost workers probably more than the 1% difference in settlements. 
Wage rises for 1986-87 have finally settled into the 6 to 7.5% range after a lengthy standoff. It's been hard, but I think also it's been a very satisfying year for a lot of people in industrial relations in that they can actually see some practical good coming out of it, whereas in the past you finish a wage rate and you think, well, what was that all about? What good has that done for anybody? This year, in fact, you can see, hopefully, we will see some practical good coming out of the other end. While the employers might be seen as the winners this year, the real losers have been the victims of redundancy. Farmers Co-op and Fokker too, with the promise of more job losses in the freezing industry. The railways with Wanganui's East Town workshops and other cutbacks. Morrison's in the Hawke's Bay, and those still to come, like Ford's in the Hutt Valley. As usual, animal stories were firm favourites with news editors around the world. The one that probably attracted the most attention in 1986 was about Yambo the gorilla at Jersey Zoo in the Channel Islands. When young Levin Merritt fell six metres into the gorilla enclosure, Yambo stood guard to make sure the other gorillas didn't harm him. And as the injured boy lay unconscious, Yambo reached out and touched him, showing his concern to the world. Moments later, Levin began to regain consciousness and made a noise which startled Yambo and family. The distraction was enough to scare off the animals and zookeepers rushed to the boy's aid. Levin recovered in hospital and Yambo's popularity soared to new heights. Also popular, but not as public, was the panda born at Tokyo Zoo. So as not to interrupt mother and baby, zookeepers kept spectators away and used an infrared camera to monitor the youngster. Named Tonton, it's still puzzling zookeepers who have to wait a few more months before they can determine its sex. Also making his public debut was one of the few orcas or killer whales to be born in captivity. Mum was at an aquarium in Florida. <laughs> have you made your point now? Finally, at 20 past six, she began spiraling with tremendous force. Yes. The youngster was a strapping 135 kilo girl and was called Baby Shamoon. If she took to the water, so too did this rabbit called Hobie, who proved that it's not just humans who come up with new fads and fashions in that American state where anything can happen, California. This peculiar bunny, jacuzzi the way he is can. He wants a carrot juice cocktail on the rocks, a terry cloth bathrobe and some argyle socks. Ain't nothing like a hot tub to make him feel better, except the playboy bunny in an angle sweater. Closer to home, this youngster was born in South Auckland and turned heads when people saw her size. Born to a Timor pony mother and a Shetland father, she measured just 45 centimetres at birth. And although she's still got some growing to do, the youngster, called Jackie, will never be one of the big names in the horse world. The opposite could be said for Bone Crusher with its remarkable run of wins in Australia. But the chestnut gelding came to a sudden halt when illness prevented it meeting Waverley Star as Australasian representatives in the Japan Cup. You know, in such changing times, it's nice to know some things stay the same. Hmm? I mean, how do they do it? Choice sure, so always tastes so good, so consistent. Robots. Pardon? Robots. Hundreds of little green robots with specially programmed taste buds, sipping choice of tea all day long. It's called quality control. I wouldn't mind a job like that. Have a cup of choice, sir. Quality. This Sunday at Pukekohe, it's the Meter Coffee as New Zealand Grand Prix. Be there or watch the action live during a sports special Sunday afternoon on two in association with Meter Copiers. Some copier companies make cameras. Meter doesn't. Some make clock radios. Meter wouldn't hear of it. You see, we believe the best way to make better copiers is to make nothing but copiers. Meter, all we make are great copiers. The New Zealand Grand Prix from Pukekohe this Sunday afternoon on two. We've taken all the firepower and accuracy of our explosive cannon metal woods and built an arsenal around them. Spalding unleashes the cannon woods and irons. Fire one. Fire six. Fire nine. For incredible power and accuracy, don't just reach for a golf club. Fire a cannon. The cannon.
cannon, woods, and irons from Spalding. Here's your chance with NutraSweet to support our team on KZ7 in the America's Cup Challenge. For every one of these 100% NutraSweet products you buy in the months of January and February, NutraSweet and each of these brands will make a contribution to the New Zealand Challenge. So come on, New Zealand. Give it some Kiwi magic. Let's enjoy the sugar-free taste of sugar from NutraSweet while we cheer home KZ7 and the crew at Fremantle. New Year's Eve's great fun, isn't it, Mike? It's a time for parties, isn't it, Mike? And we're inviting you to three great New Year's Eve parties right here on one tonight. You wouldn't say no to that, would you, Mike? No. As New Zealand business expanded its horizons during 1986, Chile was targeted, and this year alone more than half a billion dollars has been invested, mostly in forestry and food processing ventures. However, the closer ties with Chile have been politically unpopular in some quarters here. Opponents point to unrest in the country. Another state of siege was declared this year, following an attempt to kill the president, General Pinochet. In response, he ordered a three-month crackdown, jailing left-wing leaders, expelling foreign churchmen, ordering house-to-house -house searches, further muzzling the news media, and using strong-arm tactics against street demonstrations. In September, the Cold War was on again between Moscow and Washington, as spying accusations flew back and forth. First, Soviet UN employee Gennady Zakharov was arrested, allegedly in possession of secret Air Force documents, and then, in apparent retaliation, American journalist Nick Danilov was picked up in Moscow. Danilov was accused of holding secret maps and photos and jailed despite US claims he'd been framed. After several days' tense negotiations, Danilov was freed, and shortly afterwards the charges against Zakharov were dropped. Probably the biggest ongoing story in New Zealand this year has been the economy, the size of the internal deficit, the bullish share market, and the millions made by investment entrepreneurs were popular topics of conversation. In fact, economic concerns seem to become a national fixation. It was the family pay packet that bore the brunt of Roger Nomics in 1986. Everyone spending power was affected by one of the government's biggest economic shake-ups. The arrival on October the 1st of the goods and services tax. Millions were spent explaining the biggest tax reform for a generation. It seems New Zealanders got the message loud and clear and celebrated with a pre-GST spending binge. The country's banks also went shopping this year for customers. New clients were wooed with bigger loans and cheaper interest rates. No customer was too old or too young. The junior super saver, especially for kids under 14 years of age. The time when people had to go cap in hand to plead for a loan disappeared in 1986. Swept aside by the new era of competition that could produce as many as 25 new banks. Expensive metal toy soldiers painted by hand for export to wealthy Americans is just one small example of newfound aggression shown by New Zealanders expanding their business empires abroad. Others like Bob Jones had much larger targets in mind after pulling off one of Australia's biggest property coups. And I think it's a country of enormous opportunity and I'm happy to buy it all up. Smart thinking firms were much quicker than Australian competitors to exploit markets created by CER. At the same time, the foreign exchange market and rapid changes in the value of the Kiwi dollar continued to create problems for exporters. At home, business life was dominated by spectacular deals. Huge mergers like the marriage between food giants Watties and Goodmans or the arrival of the new Briley-backed airline to challenge Air New Zealand's monopoly. But the one sector that dominated economic life above all others in 1986 was the share market. One finance company alone has apparently lent a total of $12 million just to people in Wellington so they could come here to the share market and speculate. Rising prices produce a bull market, and it seems the bulls hardly pause for breath in a record-breaking year that saw more fortunes made than were lost. The demand for shares has been so heavy, brokers have been forced to take a long holiday break just to catch up on the paperwork. New Zealand's enthusiasm for the share market produced a new crop of heroes. 4,000 people celebrated Ron Briley's record-breaking year, one of the largest meetings of shareholders to be held anywhere in the world. Adulation was showered upon the successful. The Briley shares, I would say, uh, I've done better than striking the Kiwi. The government's deficit 
the difference between its income and spending will dominate 1987. The $3,000 million gap threatens the very heart of government economic policy, cutting inflation to single figures. In the business world, there's applause for government sticking to policies when the going gets tough. Whether the rest of the country is convinced government's on the right track economically is a question that will be answered soon at the ballot box. Back overseas, another natural disaster, the strongest earthquake to hit Central America in many years, struck on October the 11th. Worst hit was the capital of El Salvador, where six buildings in the city centre collapsed and a nearby slum was flattened, killing hundreds of refugees from the country's long-running civil war. Other victims were children, trapped in the rubble of what was once a school and a hospital. The final death toll from the quake and seven aftershocks topped 1,800. Apart from the ever-present risk of natural disaster, the threat of nuclear war was of grave concern to many people this year. While peace groups lobbied politicians to disarm, the American and Soviet leaders used the medium of television to talk directly to the people of each other's nations. The reduction of nuclear warheads and the Star Wars program were the main themes of President Reagan's address. Mr. Gorbachev and I agreed we will seek agreements on the principle of 50% reductions in offensive nuclear arms and an interim agreement on intermediate range nuclear systems. And it's my hope that one day we will be able to eliminate these weapons altogether and rely increasingly for our security on defense systems that threaten no one. Both the United States and Soviet Union are doing research on the possibilities of applying new technologies to the cause of defense. If these technologies become a reality, it is my dream that or to one day free us all from the threat of nuclear destruction. For his part, Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev used his appearance on American TV to pledge his country's commitment to peace, saying the only alternative would be disaster. The United States, too, people realize that our two nations should never be at war, that a collision between them would be the greatest of tragedies. In May, Prime Minister Longy was in Cologne, West Germany, explaining the government's anti-nuclear philosophy to 3,000 delegates attending the Congress of Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. The arms race will end with the understanding that nuclear weapons themselves are the greatest danger to us. It will end when we see nuclear arsenals not as a symbol of security, but as an awesome threat. Then in October, the superpower leaders met each other halfway between Moscow and Washington in the Icelandic capital of Reykjavik to discuss a draft on nuclear arms control. But after two days of rigorous talks, the Icelandic summit ended in failure, with President Reagan and General Secretary Gorbachev blaming each other for its lack of success. Proposals on the table had included the removal of medium-range missiles from Europe by both sides and 50% cuts in their nuclear arsenals. America's Star Wars program proved to be the sticking point, President Reagan said it wasn't a bargaining chip and rejected the Soviet demand to restrict all work on the system to laboratory research. The failure of the summit was even more disappointing given that 1986 was United Nations International Year of Peace. Among the year's highlights, though, the Pope played his part, calling leaders from 12 major world religions together at Assisi in Italy. As the denominations joined in prayer for world peace, the Pope called for a day-long ceasefire in major conflicts around the globe, Unfortunately, the plea was ignored. Peace here was marked in Wellington with a peace ribbon stretching from the American to the Soviet embassies. More than 2,000 banners from around the country were included. Meanwhile, Te Horiri Primary School on Waiheke Island was one of many that had peace studies added to the curriculum this year, an important addition for the young pupils. If I have children, I don't want them to grow up and, and sort of be killed in the war or something like that. I learned that you can um, be kind to each other and you don't have to fight to get other things and all that stuff. <laughs> the children tied messages to balloons on International Peace Day, October the 6th, and then released them, hoping their concern for a peaceful world would carry right around the globe. The local body elections came and went during October, but a change in the voting system prompted more than the usual lack of public interest. In many parts of the country, postal voting was introduced for the first time and votes cast were noticeably up. In Wellington, a Labour mayor and council were elected, while Cliff Skeggs ran as an independent in Dunedin and retained the mayoralty. But it was Tim Shadbolt in Waitamata City where most attention centred. 
There was a massive 80% voter turnout, and Tim's team won all 15 seats, with 18-year-old Judith Webley the highest polling candidate. For Mayor of Shadbolt, the bitterness of his last term was now behind him. And it just means real change out everywhere. And, it, and let's hope it goes right through all the other cities. From now on, we're going to see a completely different type of person standing for council, and we're going to see them succeeding. And that's what the future's going to be. So good on you, everyone. We're doing it. Environmental issues came to the fore late in the year, highlighted by protest on the Coromandel and in the Waikato. West of Huntley, farmers barricaded the gates to William Blair's farm to stop state coal coming in with a drilling rig to prospect for coal. But under the law, state coal had the power to come onto his property without a license or the owner's permission. And they did so at dawn one morning, 11 days later. In the Coromandel, the opposition to mining by local residents reached a confrontation. In the Whangapore State Forest, another drilling rig wanted to prospect for gold but protesters tramped into the forest and tried to stop it. 41 people were arrested, though none was charged. The protest meant a big contingent of police had to help the mining company to get on with its exploration. In Coromandel, as in Huntley, local people felt the miners had all the rights. But a week later, all the parties involved had reached an agreement around the table. So in 1987, they want the government to make mining like any other land use, requiring town and country planning consent and the permission of landowners before it can proceed. Indian Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi was in the country for a short visit during October. He met business and political leaders to discuss buying agricultural and forestry technology and the sale of industrial products. During talks with the government, military cooperation wasn't a topic of discussion, but Mr Gandhi did detail India's nuclear policy which has seen the country develop a nuclear weapon but promised not to use it. On its 40th birthday, the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra celebrated its past but got a verbal present from the Prime Minister it could have done without. Describing the orchestra as an expensive titillation for the elite, Mr Longy said he preferred the music of dire straits. The Prime Ministerial opinion didn't impress visiting flautist James Galway. I think it would be much better if your Prime Minister was remembered for the man who put the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra on the map along with all the other positive aspects of New Zealand instead of one who's going around throwing stones at his own glass house, so to speak. Mr Longley's predecessor certainly wasn't keeping to politics. His horror show performance as narrator revealed ability on another platform. For New Zealand authors this year, recognition and reward in the Wattie Book Awards. From 89 entries, and especially from a field of fiction works dominated by Māori writers, it was Witi Ihamaira's epic, The Matriarch, that took first prize. And while the New Zealand film industry has had a quiet year, Putlot Flats, a dog's tail, looks set to be a smash. In November, the controversy over Bastion Point was reopened, when the Waitangi Tribunal started hearing a claim for the return of land to the Ngāti Whātua people. Closing the hearing, Chief Judge Eddie Jury said that the Ngāti Whātua of Orake may represent the most severe case of cultural genocide in New Zealand. At year's end, the Tribunal had not yet made any recommendations, but Tribunal Counsel George Halley has suggested that most of the claims should be granted. Also in November, the Tribunal was praised by Northland Tribes for urgent action given to please to safeguard Māori land claims. An approach by the tribunal produced last-minute changes to the government's state-owned enterprises bill. But one year after tribunal recommendations to clean up the Manukau Harbour and redress wrongs against Māori land and fisheries, little has been done. We've waited so long, our people, you know, 146 years. We waited two years to have the case brought before the tribunal. We waited nine months for the decision. And now 12 months on, still nothing has been done. Traditional fishing rights were given legal recognition this year when the Christchurch High Court ruled in favour of a Māori man convicted of taking undersized power. This decision is seen as a major victory in the restoration of rights promised by the Treaty of Waitangi. Earlier in the year, the tribunal recommended that Māori become an official language in government departments, local bodies and courts. Some of the tribunal's recommendations are in line with the bill introduced into Parliament last week by Māori Affairs Minister Koro Retari. But the tribunal goes further than the bill. It wants acceptance of both written and spoken Māori as official language in courts. It wants an inquiry into the way Māori children are educated. Those who want to should be able to learn the language from an early age. 
Schools, the tribunal says, are the place to start to avoid future racial tension. New Zealand's race relations hit the headlines several times in 1986. The race relations office released a survey which showed that Māori and Pacific Island people are seriously discriminated against when they look for rental flats and houses. Conciliator Wally Hirsch drew flack when he coined the phrase white flight, maintaining that Pākehā parents bypassing schools with a high Māori and Polynesian role were exhibiting racial prejudice. And former conciliator Hiwi Taurua lashed out at the education system, blaming school principals for perpetuating a form of white superiority. Get up there and say to the members of your boards, the members who are your friends, and just simply say that taha Māori is important to me as a New Zealander. And that will get you a little bit of rejection. <laughs> Some of us are used to it. The social welfare system also came in for criticism after a year-long investigation found that many of the department's practices are discriminatory. Social Welfare Minister Anne Herc has promised immediate steps to remedy this. And how would a woman lodge the complaint with the Race Relations Office when she had two cheques dishonoured by a bank because they were written in Māori? Isabel Wanita took legal advice and found there was no law against writing cheques in Māori. Why do you write your cheques in Māori? Because Māori is the language of my tūpuna and it is the language of this country. Māori and Pākehā Roman Catholics came together this year for the visit of Pope John Paul II, the first Pope ever to come to this country. He made a brief stop here on a visit to Asia and the South Pacific. It was a tight and demanding schedule for the 66-year-old pontiff. Pope John Paul stepped onto New Zealand soil and made his traditional gesture. The official welcoming party included the Governor-General, Sir Paul Reeves, and the Prime Minister, but at the Auckland domain there was a full-scale national Maori welcome. Using the specially constructed Pope Mobile, the Pontiff made a circuit of the grounds, an exercise he was to repeat in other centres he visited, and one which was clearly appreciated by young and old. The Pope conducted three open-air masses on his pastoral visit. The summit was of special significance. Many received communion from the Pope himself. Crowds attending the masses were well below the predictions. Nevertheless, thousands of New Zealanders took the opportunity to see and hear the Pope on what was probably the only visit he will make to this country. Religious and political strife continued in Northern Ireland this year and was fuelled by the signing of the Anglo-Irish Accord. This gave the Dublin government a limited say in the affairs of the North and provoked a bitter campaign by Ulster Protestants to get the accord scrapped. The campaign extended to the European Council of Ministers where British leader Margaret Thatcher had her speech Sorry, interrupted. You, the offender was hardline yeah. Protestant Reverend Ian Paisley who proceeded to take a banner out of his pocket and turn himself into a human sandwich board. Paisley stayed put, making his point, until ejected by security staff. A story that won't go away for the White House has developed in recent months into the biggest scandal for the Reagan administration. The story broke as the media investigated rumours of US arms sales to Iran to help obtain the release of American hostages held in Beirut. After weeks of warning journalists off the story, the president went on national television to admit he had authorized the sale of defensive military equipment and spare parts to Tehran, despite American foreign policy against dealing with governments accused of supporting terrorism. But there was more to come. Ten million dollars from the arms sales had been channeled illegally to the Contra rebels in Nicaragua, and another twelve million dollars was unaccounted for. Heads rolled at the White House. National Security Advisor John Poindexter resigned and Marine Colonel Oliver North was fired. So far, only North is accused of masterminding the operation. He's revealed little to a Senate investigation, but says he does I want to tell more. I don't think another person in America that wants to tell this story as much as I do, sir. Thank you, sir. Public opinion polls reveal most Americans don't feel the president has told the whole truth about his involvement or knowledge of the affair, but he's pledged to get to the bottom of it. If illegal acts were undertaken, those who did so will be brought to justice. If actions in implementing my policy were taken without my authorization, knowledge, or concurrence, this will be exposed and appropriate corrective steps will be implemented. The White House is apparently hoping the scandal will die down over the holiday break, but many commentators say the president still has to weather quite a storm. 
The flimsy experimental plane Voyager proved a distraction from America's political worries in December. After six years planning, its two-person crew attempted to pilot it on the first flight around the world without refueling. Despite some bad weather and technical problems, the Voyager made it safely back to California, taking nine days, four hours for the round trip. And finally, to end the year on a very positive note, the America's Cup, the elite competition for 12-metre yachts which newcomer New Zealand has dominated so far. In all, 13 yacht clubs from six countries have been battling each other for the chance to face Australia's Cup defender early in the new year. They've been surging through the notorious choppy waters and high winds off the Fremantle coast, breaking masts, losing men overboard and up the rigging. For KZ7, 33 wins and one loss for a berth in the semi-finals but lingering controversy over the yacht's fiberglass construction. The plastic fantastic hasn't pleased everyone. Something's screwy in here. Something, something is really uh, not There's been straight. 78 12 meters built all in aluminum, and so if you want to build a glass boat, why would you do it? Unless you yeah. wanted to cheat. Whoa, whoa, I don't think he should have said that. However, the retesting of KZ7's construction has revealed nothing irregular, allowing skipper Chris Dixon and crew to concentrate on just We're out one there to thing. Win every race, and we uh, we tackle each race uh, equally. KZ7's now just one win away from reaching the finals, where it's likely the opponent will be Dennis Connor in Stars and Stripes, while the right to defend the cup looks to be going to either Australia 4 or Kookaburra 3. For the Kiwi Challenge, the prospect of picking up the coveted trophy is no longer a dream, it's a real possibility. And on that note, we end News 86 and hope that victory in the America's Cup is just one of many things we all have to look forward to in 1987. Good night.